In mid-March of this year, China embarked on what I'm going to suggest is the most important environmental reforms it's undertaken in the 21st century. Now, being that this was such a recent event, it's impossible for us today to try to evaluate the effectiveness of these reforms uh, or whether they will in fact do as they are intended, which is to usher China in to a new era, era of environmental governance uh, and sustainable development. Uh, I, I want to begin by uh, discussing what I oxymoronically call China's old modern economy. This is the growth model that really began, if we're going to put a line in the sand, with the Deng Xiaoping reforms of the late 1970s, uh, and had several features that are very relevant to understanding China's current physical environment and the need and the impetus, impetuses behind the reforms that they are now embarking on. Uh, it was a period of extreme economic growth uh, and a success story that pulled hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. This economic growth was based upon heavy industry, heavy investment in such heavy industry, uh, and a strong dependence on the physical exports and construction that it yielded. We're talking about sectors like steel, cement, uh, et cetera, all of which were heavily fossil fuel dependent. And by coming together in a bilateral agreement um, that said that not only are we going to both honor these new commitments as part of the UN framework, uh, but that we are going to come out and vocally say that we're going to do so in concert and that we are committed to a successful outcome at Paris, really changed the whole tenor of that COP. Usually at COPs, you go in somewhat nervous. Uh, excuse me, COP means Conference of the Parties. That's the annual meeting of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the kind of climate summit internationally every year. You go into a COP with uh, some nervousness, about whether you'll reach an agreement. Uh, you get increasingly depressed the next week and a half as the fighting becomes more and more petulant and petty. Uh, and then in the last kind of 48 hours, everyone stays up till four in the morning and hammers out a lowest common denominator agreement um, that they can live with, but that no one's really happy with. And I know that sounds very cynical. I actually don't mean it to sound as cynical as it does uh, now hearing myself say it. Um, but that is, that is kind of the functional, practical reality of the, the atmospherics, uh, which I guess is a pun in this case to many of those conferences. Um, Paris was different. Because you had President Xi and President Obama come out and say, uh, here's what we're going to do, and we're committed to a successful outcome to this meeting. The whole tenor of that week and a half was, all right, well, we're going to get to an agreement. It's going to replace the regime that has come before. It's going to involve large developing and developed countries. It's going to be inclusive. Um, and it is going to find some kind of palatable success. We just have to hammer out some details on issues X, Y, and Z. Now, what, why, why do I bring that up in the context of something where I'm talking about domestic environmental policy reforms? I think that it exemplifies that China is already, because of very self-interested reasons on this path towards trying to curtail domestic air pollution, on trying to structurally try. Um, there's a famous maxim, and I'll mention Deng Xiaoping again because it's attributed to him, I don't care if the cat is white or black as long as it catches mice. Now what this means for environmental policy is what I'll categorize as the hook, which is economic incentives and, and different policy tools like its budding national emissions trading system like feed-in tariffs, like subsidies towards the uh, kind of sustainable technologies and the scaling up of gas and renewables, um, as well as nuclear that I mentioned previously, um, that will try to alter behaviors through incentive and through carrots, if you will. Uh, and then there is the punitive side, the environmental policy parlance, the command and control in which we see the stricter regulations coming down the pike and the growing ability to enforce them. Uh, previous inspection campaigns tended to be uh, irregular and, and to a large extent ineffective, um, but the new ministry, ministries really that have been created are an attempt to, to address that. They are more well-resourced, 
They have personnel throughout the country that it can, can engage in the sorts of inspections that we're increasingly seeing since March of this year. Um, and importantly, they are attempting to solidify the mandate of the policy-making bodies and also destroy some ambiguity about responsibility. Uh, and this is really where we begin to get into some of the, the interesting questions about how effective it will be, what its challenges will be, um, and, and what the sort of earmarks are for trying to, to assess those challenges and to predict its future effectiveness. That's what I hope that we'll be able to discuss rather than me to kind of uh, give you my, my complete take right now. Uh, and before getting into that discussion, I do just want to mention what some of the international implications are likely to be for the success or failure of Chinese environmental policy and the ways in which these domestic factors are relevant outside of Chinese, China's borders. Um, one, and uh, Again, here I'm, I'm treading over some territory I've, I've trod on elsewhere, uh, so forgive me for that. Uh, we see China's international investment growing and growing and growing, and it's beginning to capture these investments under something called the Belt and Road Initiative, or the BRI. Um, <clears throat> formerly called One Belt, One Road, the battle for clunky acronyms, BRI won out over OBOR. Uh, several of us were betting on it, so uh, here, here we go. Um, the, the BRI is, by some estimations, just a, a marketing slogan under which foreign direct investment is captured in China. And by other estimations, it is the largest concentrated international investment campaign since World War II, since the post-World War II rebuilding of Europe. I, I actually think both are, are somewhat true. Um, and that the future of the, the BRI is very much uncertain um, and, and has a lot of important questions to be asked about it, some of which we'll be doing uh, along with colleagues that are here at Duke Kunshan in October. But for our purposes, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about China's investment internationally in the energy sector and specifically in the coal sector. So as it goes through this kind of structural economic transformation at home, as it begins to abate pollution at home, as it begins to pursue this more um, progressive climate strategy at home, that excess capacity that I mentioned in the steel sector, in the cement sector, uh, in the coal sector, needs a place to go. Uh, it, it either needs to evolve into some new kind of uh, you know, economic landing place in China, where it can absorb the sorts of labor that used to be involved in that. It's not so different than what we go through here in places like Kentucky or West Virginia in those coal sectors. These don't, just because China has a more command and control government, just dissipate completely uh, with, with no implications. So the result has largely been to date to defray that excess capacity internationally. And this dovetails very nicely with China's geopolitical strategy of bringing more of its near abroad into its economic orbit. Um, in practice, this means building rail, building roads, and building coal-fired power plants in Central, South, and Southeast Asia. So I want to give you a few figures on that. Uh, between 2007 and 2015, G20 nations as a whole invested $76 billion in international coal projects. China was the number one investor at $25 billion. Any guesses about who the others were? Yeah. Any G20, G20 countries, but they're the largest. India. Uh, India is India's a good guess, but uh, the second largest is Japan, and the third and fourth are Korea, South Korea, and Germany. Um, South Korea and Germany is not always, uh, actually, in fact, all three of those are sometimes a surprise to people. India is a top recipient of that investment. Other large recipients are, the, are you know, large developing countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, and Turkey. By the end of 2016, China's, Chinese companies and banks had been involved in 240 coal-fired power projects in 25 of the 65 countries of the Belt and Road. This investment's coming from five major SOEs, state-owned enterprises in China, which represent almost all of that investment. Uh, and a figure that really jumps out to me, uh, these firms are now involved in the construction, ownership, or financing of at least 16% of all coal-fired power station power stations under development in the world outside of China. Not just power stations that are receiving international investment, all of them. So roughly one-fifth 
of the coal-fired coal power plants under construction in the world outside of China are being undertaken with some level of Chinese investment. Now, it's also, of course, in, oh, excuse me, I meant to point. It's also involved in investing in clean energy. And I think, and one of the things that I hope that we'll be able to discuss at Kunshan, as well as here if, you, if you'd like, is that we're at a crossroads on what kind of investment in the energy sector China is going to be emphasizing moving forward. None of these domestic reforms really address that issue. They, uh, in fact, in some ways, will incentivize investment into the fossil fuel and dirty energy produ production internationally because it will need that sort of place to go. Uh, but there are some levers that can be pulled, and there are aspects of Chinese foreign policy making that can actually perhaps start to, to incentivize more of this and less than this.